Welcome to the Cognitive Rampage podcast. No intro music as always. Diving right into it just to bring you the guest because we try to keep within the hour now. So uh, you're going to learn a lot about uh, the relationship that I have with the man that's on the show today, Stanley Fisher Jr. or just Stan Fisher, Stan the Monkey Boy, etc. But there's so much to this man. He's an American entrepreneur, actor. He's been on voice, stage and film, audio producer, director and radio host. Now, I normally let the guests do their own intro, but we'll get to it. But I just... I'm proud of my friends. So with two decades of experience, he's managed to be in voice production, digital, local, regional, national radio, commercial advertising, created children's audio books, radio programming content for national charities, produced national radio, that's a brand, hosted radio shows, and performed on camera for commercial advertising and independent films, all while holding down a 20-year broadcast career for companies like iHeartMedia, which he's back to, which I can't wait to hear about the new venture, and has done it for Premier Radio Networks and Intercom as an on-air talent producer, and my dude got one of those glass awards as a production director, man. He's also dedicated his personal time to helping wounded veterans. If you've seen him on Facebook, he's running all these marathons, and he does it by participating in six races for the Fisher, Fisher House Foundation. That's his own organization, nonprofit. He's run four marathons, one 10K, and, and has raised nearly $8,000 in donations as a teammate, donated nearly $10,000 in voice work and production as a corporate champion, and in 2015 became the new voice of the Fisher House Foundation. He's currently hanging out in the Carolinas, up in the cabins, recessing with primal nature, as I always like to say, managing the company's voice of <laughs> productions, my demo dude, to which I was a keynote not a while ago. And then beyond that, he has a Radiothon audio and Monkey Boy Productions. That is one of the longest winded intros I've ever done, man, yes. for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> you, that, was, that was deep. Man. That's hilarious. Yeah, thanks, man. That's hilarious. Yeah, hey, real quick, the Fisher House Foundation, just so you know, is uh, one of the largest nonprofit groups for wounded military created back in 1992. I wish I could say it was mine. We just happen to have the same last name. That's the only reason, man. People people think that all the time. They're like, man, I ain't donating to your house. I'm like, it ain't my house. I was like, I was like, wish it was my house. If it was, it'd be worth billions of dollars. I wouldn't have to be working anymore. But nah, it's a, it's a foundation that I was introduced to back in 2011, and it's been a that that's been its own adventure and fun ride. So I just wanted to make sure you knew that because right. everyone confuses that because my last name is Fisher. So, Well, yeah, let's just say we'll uh, we'll act like it just stayed that. So, I mean, either way, man, you're donating to that call <laughs> time and money, man. There's something that's, you know, deep inside a, a close love of the cognitive rampage and the tribe of change, which is uh, are the veterans. Those suffering from PTSD. You know, I got a lot of good friends that yes. have been over and back. They have friends that have been over and not come back. And so supporting something like that, man, is, is something I love. I, I, I watched you on Facebook, man, getting your run on. <laughs> Thanks, man. I'm a horrible marathon runner, but all my all my military buddies are like, you're like a little tank, man. Like you don't have the best marathon time, but you don't stop. So this will be uh, this year will be my sixth race, and as a team, we've collected well over thirty thousand dollars from the military, and it's been it's been a great adventure because starting off, I was pretty it was a pretty big challenge for me. I ended up losing like eighty pounds for the first run, uh, and completing my first marathon ride out of the gate. I never ran a five k or ten k. And after working in audio studios for 10 years, I certainly was not in no shape for something like that. And growing up, I was always an athlete. So to get involved in audio studio work and then asked to run a marathon, everyone thought I was crazy. But I ended up completing that run and uh, beat out all the Marines that were running with me and fundraising. It was kind of fun to let a civilian kick the crap out of them. Oh, man, they probably let you. <laughs> so. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's what it was. I, I was just, I was just better than them, so that's all it was. But, uh, but no, it's been a fun camaraderie working with these guys and uh, and running and raising funds because it really opened up my eyes to people that are like true heroes for our country that we forget about. We spend a lot of time focusing on the wrong things at times, and not people that give us the freedom to pick which bathrooms we want to use or or to who we want to, you know, dedicate our time to. And to give back to our wounded military was important to me because I come from a military heavy family. And um, we ended up dedicating that first run to a Marine who was killed in action on his first tour of Afghanistan. And I was able to get his day um, honored to him, a proclamation made by the city of Atlanta 
to honor the day he was killed in action as Lance Corporal Christopher Blake Rogers Day. And that kind of giving back to the community and, and to people like that really changed my life and outlook on things and to give it back to the roots of where my family comes from. So I appreciate you acknowledging that because it's uh, it's been a big deal for me. And then I also do stuff for uh, children's hospitals across the country, creating success stories of all these children that have faced leukemia, brain cancer, uh, and other types of illnesses. And to, again, to get back in that arena has been an eye-opening experience. So, Yeah, we talked briefly uh, about uh, some of that work that you've been doing up there in the Carolinas with the kids and cancer. But before I, I get into way into that, you referenced it a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to where you came from because I've okay. been the people that I have on the show, what I try to do is bring out the epigenetic influences, the stories, where it came from to mold the man that you are today, that list of what you do, what you've accomplished, you know, that's good. And I want to get to that, but I want to know the story that created the man that does that, you know? So, I mean, we, we come from similar, well, the same town and so what was what was home like in the Fisher House for real? Now the your Fisher House, not the foundation. Um, as a child, you know, the first seven, eight years of my life, I recognized that I had a family. And that is a traditional married couple, a uh, mom and dad, um, in my home. My dad was a blue collared firefighter and my mom was a working nurse. Uh, through those years, to be quite honest, being transparent of what that looks like is we developed into those eight years and I was about between the ages of six and eight, I started to notice that my family had problems. My, fa my mom and dad would fight a lot. Um, I didn't quite understand what that looked like as a kid. Um, I didn't really understand what that looked like until I was an adult. But uh, in the fourth grade, my parents ended up divorcing. Um, I, in first and third grade, my mom disappeared for an entire week both those years, it was never explained to me. Um, but as a, again, as, a, as an adult, that time frame was explained to me in a bigger picture because what I, what I started to figure out or discover into high school was that my mom had an ongoing drug problem and my dad stepped in front of that train to stop it. And long story short, they divorced over the fact that my mom did not want to seek help. She was a, a typical nurse working in the medical field. And if you know anything about the heritage of medicine as practiced, specifically here in the States, there's a lot of nurses end up hooked on drugs. Uh, my mom believes in medications. Um, a lot of people don't. I personally don't. Um, I believe in more of a whole homeopathic place because I've watched what popping pills will do to the body and to the mind. And my mom has been in drug rehabilitation at least six or seven times. Um, it nearly destroyed her about five years ago. So that has been an ongoing battle as to what that looks like. And my dad lived quite the opposite life, you know, has a couple of homes, plenty of money set aside. And um, that was kind of a, a quick picture of what the household looked like. You know, my mom would throw plates at my dad to get his attention. My dad didn't want to show her any attention because he was mad. And it was just an uncomfortable environment until they divorced. Uh, after the divorce in fourth grade, fifth grade, my stepdad showed up into the picture and moved into the house that my dad built with his own two hands, which made the elements even weirder. Um, I, I didn't understand why this stranger was living in our house and brought three kids into the equation. One of the three kids that was brought into the house was a crack addict. He was uh, very sick. He tried to kill me twice, once by knife and second by drowning uh, at Lake Orla Vista behind the right there in Orla Vista off of Kirkman Road by Universal Studios, and has spent most of his life in prison for trying to take out nine cops in Winter Garden while hooked on some sort of drug. He's been in and out of jails and prisons, and he's, in my opinion, a real scumbag. Um, but that's the household I grew up in. The other sisters, his other sisters, lived in the house for a short period of time, and uh, they were a little bit nicer, but ultimately it was a house in my opinion, in full trash. And I had to live in that environment until uh, well into my early 20s. Everyone, as we got older, kind of went our own way. But the um, that adversity in that household didn't really change until my mom and stepdad split in my 20s. Um, coming out of high school, my mom got sick with brain cancer um, and ended up uh, having a really hard time dealing with that, which the drug use ramped its way up and my stepdad and his lack of integrity decided that he couldn't handle the situation and started cheating on my mom and then left. Uh, my mom in the middle of the night left the house that my dad built, 
left all her belongings, family heirlooms to get away from him and never returned back to that house and started to live a whole new life, rehabilitating herself to the best of her abilities to overcome the brain cancer damages uh, inflicted to her brain and to let herself know that she could survive without some abusive man in her life and of course abusing herself and there was a process for the last 20 years where she has lived on her own in Castleberry up until this past year uh, she did rehabilitate herself from brain damages they told her that she would never recover from and she has lived a fairly normal life being a grandmother and uh, uh, even though she's been disabled so uh, that's kind of a quick version of the last I would say 30 uh, I'll be 40 next year, 30, 40 years of my life. Uh, there's a lot more personal detail, but I think you get the gist of it. <laughs> Jeez, man. Uh, I, I mean, to respond to something to even say I understand would be not even congruent. I mean, we can't understand what somebody experiences. But what I started to see is, well, it would be hard to get attention in, in a setup like that, to be noticed, to be authenticated, to be you know, loved yes. individually. You know, I'm starting to kind of see why the personality development into radio, into, you know, the growth into that. I mean, was it difficult finding that kind of uh, authentication, if you will? Um, well, I was a baby in the family and anybody's done any research on how you're born into your family and what that dictates of your personality. They found that babies in the family tend to be the entertainer, the comedians. That's how they stand out. I'm a baby. Oh. So na naturally you know, some of my strong suits were breaking up the tension, breaking up the bold by being funny, you know, uh, sitting at the dinner table, mooning my sister's friends during a party. That was my thing. Even in high school, um, it, I was class clown senior year in high school. You know, I, 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 it was easy for me to gain attention in the room. And I needed that attention because at home I was hurting. I was suffocating. My dad was the two or three miles away. I mean, yes, coping. it was a survival trait. Yeah, it was a complete survival trait because anytime some excuse the language, some shit would go down, I would come in and make a joke and lighten the room. Um, I learned, uh, I went through Second City out in Los Angeles to teach me about comedy because I saw it as a strong suit when I started acting and I wanted to understand why it was there. Uh, between that and going through the landmark education, I discovered that comedy is derived from drama. So if you take a dramatic situation, something that is malignant in life, comedy would be benign. It's serious, but you're not going to die from it. You know, it's like watching Seinfeld and somebody's in a wheelchair going down a hill. It's funny. The person's not going to die, but they're going to be injured a little bit. And it's funny. And in dramatic situation, it's, you know, it, it's like the devil's advocate. Someone's going to die. It's going to be intense and it's going to be painful. And I learned how to take an environment and break up the monotony, break up that, that tension. And I learned what that tension felt like. So anytime I found myself in a situation that was really serious like that, it was easy for me just to come through and boom hit the situation and like I said, break it up. Well, so, I mean, you know, I write, yeah. I write in my book about early life victories and we tend to develop, you know, life tools based on those early life victories. So you found humor and comedy is that um, distraction, that, that way to step out of it. And I mean, it played into your life all the way to you were attending these classes to do so. And, and I, I couldn't agree with you more, man. I yeah. think today's comedians comics whatever you call them i would be honest to say that they're really philosophers right they're they're allowed to talk about the generation about the time and that, that i can see why that adapted early for you and early into your career and why that played into your career choice when i was 18 I, I ended up seeking out a job in radio broadcasting it was something i was drawn to as a teenager early teenager my cousin chris was doing radio or working in radio at that same radio station in Orlando and it still exists it's called XL 106.7 and there was a morning show they were number one in the market for like 22 25 years and I wanted to be a part of that I wanted to associate that and I was going to find my way to them one way or another and I was drawn to that because I wanted to have a voice for once because in my household to have a voice meant you came with some sort of I wouldn't say punishment but you had to stand out a little bit further than a mom who was a drug addict very dramatic making scenes in public, you know, like playing Little League Baseball. I remember sitting at, in the middle of the game and my mom passed out in the stands and they had to stop the game 
because she passed out from drug overdose. And it was, that's the kind of environment I grew up in. And it sucked because as a kid, instead of my mom giving me a hug coming out of the dugout after the game, I'm watching her get wheeled off in the fourth inning on a stretcher because she passed out for drugs, you know, and it, it wasn't like that every day, but at least once a quarter, you know, you knew something was going to blow up. You knew the Tasmanian devil was going to come blasting through. And if it wasn't her, it was my stepbrother. If it wasn't my stepbrother, it was my stepdad. You know, there was some form of verbal or physical abuse to some degree was going to happen. And you learned how to be defensive around that. In high school, what I learned how to do was put out a decoy. The person you got was not an authentic Stan. He was a scared, you know, attention-seeking, immature person that everyone loved because he was so funny. He put himself out there, you know. The guy that would show up during homecoming week wearing long johns to get everyone's attention, you know. You know, the guy that would uh, go into the bathroom and start screaming until the whole hallway stopped. You know, it was just dumb things. Barking at teachers was one of my favorite. But as I got older, I know, yeah. as I got older, oh, I also, used, I also used to show up to first grade, my first period of class, you know, after smoking a big blunt in the parking lot. That was another favorite. I don't mean to be honest, but I did. Well, I mean, and, you were literally going, I mean, someone listened to what I have to say. I mean, it, you were, that's the thing that I hope teachers, you know, can grasp onto more these days is that notion of recognizing that if a kid is acting out, you know, as such, especially, you know, uh, interrupting multiple times or being violent that it's really going, Hey, you know, listen to me, something's happening, you know, and I'm that yes. sucks. Nobody picked up on that, man. And rather you end up being the, right. The bad kid. Well, what ended up happening was I had a principal come up to me in my late twenties. Cause this would have been about 10 years ago. And they said to me, they were like, they're like, we always wondered what was going to happen with you. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, we knew you were a good kid. You were just kind of loud sometimes. And when I told him what was really going on, he was like, you know, now that I look back, you're right. And what I discovered from that conversation is that a lot of teachers do see this stuff, but because of liability, they don't want to get involved. You know, whether that's a small paycheck or they don't want to put their neck on the line, is they don't do anything. Yeah, they don't do anything until there's a, a police, until the police are involved. Yeah, it's dangerous, man. My uh, my brother's been a teacher 20 years. He's back at it over in Alaska. Uh, shout out to over there to Kenai in Alaska. But it, it's it's definitely dangerous. I mean, you you run the risk of those, you know, the parents to do that. So it's, it's definitely a difficult game to play. I'm not, you know, denying that fact. But for you, um, you know, I could see. I, I mean, it literally from out, you know, out here listening to the story, I can see that. But it's almost hard to not appreciate that, though, because the creation that began to spawn from that on the radio at XL 106.7, I mean, it was Doc and Johnny in the morning. If you lived in the great Orlando area, for the most part, you would run across XL in the morning. And that's kind of where that creativity of putting yourself out there. I mean, you had a goal, a dedication and a drive. And I mean, you got noticed, man. Well, it started in middle school. My mom actually, even though she had drug problems, she always supported me having an outlet to attach. She knew that I needed to connect the dots to get me out of that environment. And even though I didn't agree with her choice to divorce my dad, that was part of her plan was to get me away from my dad from her point of view. I don't think my dad was trying to ruin me by any stretch of the mean, but my dad did have more control issues than she did. So with that said, she started with the divorce. And then from there, when I got to middle school, I was very intrigued by music. And she bought me my first console so I could mix music in my bedroom. So when I wasn't playing sports or I wasn't chasing girls or pretending I was at school, I was at home messing with music as a mix DJ. And by the time I was 16, I was working the bar scene in Orlando. It's a huge entrepreneur, you know, because of the theme parks, the restaurants, bars. And I would tell her I was DJing a private party, but really I was at Gators Dockside on 50 and Hiawassee Road going in and making 200 bucks a night. DJ for the drunk 40 year olds. It was awesome. And um, I made I made enough money on the weekend to pay my bills instead of like working at McDonald's, which is what she wanted. And that led to me learning music production and creating mix shows for XL 106.7, which took my creativity to a whole nother level because I, I wanted it to be bigger than just some broadcast. Most broadcast places, they don't talk about creativity. They worry more about music or the money. They don't really think about creativity. And yeah. I was able to take our Friday and Saturday night show to number one within, I think it was like two ratings books. 
and it was one of the highest rated shows on one of the top best top 40 stations in the country and we were the first to play like the Backstreet Boys in sync Britney Spears and I launched like 10 current songs across the country came through my show first and one of the guys that I played on my show that was an Orlando guy he ended up having a top 40 hit I was 19 at the time pulling down a six-figure income bouncing around opening up bars and clubs and making a killing man like like and it was because of the rep that I had going through Orlando but but I I started to realize that I started to recycle that same process was starting to happen and I started noticing the partying I started noticing a little, you know some drug use showing up and I started to realize I was like if I'm not careful I'm going to find myself in the same trap that my mom has been in and I don't want to be 35 years old in a nightclub wearing tight leather pants hitting on 19 year olds all that that might be fun uh, that's not the life I wanted so I sought out music production sought out mentors and took a whole different path because I wanted a higher quality to my life and a bigger meaning to that and that's around the age of 22 to 25 is when I took a hard shift and changed course in my life dramatically and that's how I ended up on this path well, walk, walk so, me in man I mean you can't walk me up to the gate of the story and then, <laughs> and then leave me hanging Oh, so, I mean, well, I wanted to, I wanted to let you talk for a second. I wanted you to have a chance to say something. Um, yeah, though, so so 22, um, uh, the company fell apart. It wasn't hitting all all numbers. I was a little bit lost again, and um, a relationship went busted because she didn't agree with the career path I wanted, and I wasn't going to give up my creativity. But I knew that if I could, um, I wanted to sustain a lot of creativity. I didn't want to end up at some eight-hour job. And be miserable my whole life. That just wasn't me. I'm, it's as much as I play by the rules, and I'm a loyal person. I don't or typically agree with, you know, a structured environment that says this is the way you do it. Just like school, like this is the way you learn. You do it this way, because I don't learn that way. I see pictures that have me sit and read Shakespeare. Uh, I can't do it. But if you want me to get up and act it, that's totally different. You know, to to have that conversation is better for me than making me read something and then take a test. I need to have the conversation to do better, which is why I gravitated to acting. I wanted to understand human behavior, and I also I learned from a, from the conversation, not necessarily reading it. So anyway, um, I started to seek out. Um, at that time, I was being trained by an audio producer. He was somebody that worked at the station and took me under his wing, and gave me the opportunity to learn commercial production from knowing music production. And he did that to open up a doorway for me to have a line of income coming in. I didn't even, I knew it, somebody did it, but I didn't know who was doing it. And then that led to me learning voiceovers, which I knew nothing about. I had no idea there was a whole industry where people were voicing stuff for commercial advertising, documentaries, animations, phone services. I mean, the list goes on and on. Video games, I had no idea that world existed. And he started introducing me to people to teach me the industry from a creative point of view and to broaden my education. And I ended up training underneath the one of the five best or the five signature voices of Disney lived in our hometown. And he was working for ABC. He was the voice of uh, Campbell Soups. He was one of the narrators for The Land Before Time. Um, he was what? Superman on Super Friends. Yeah. <clears throat> What's his name? What's that? What's his name? Uh, his name is Bob Norris. Bob, Bob Norris, he, he ended up passing away uh, back in 2009 from congestive heart failure. But he uh, he took me under his wing. I was his last student, and he lived right by Full Sail uh, over on the east side of town. He had a house over there, and he uh, was fighting depression because he was sick with cancer, which I didn't know anything about. That led to congestive heart failure and kidney problems. Um, and I would go over there, and me showing up is what got him out of bed. So we, we ended up having this amazing bond for like four years. I would go over to his house every Sunday, and we would talk about creativity, life. He, he would talk about women, which was always fun. Um, you know, how to be successful, what broke his business up, you know, what made his business successful. And we, we built a, a real camaraderie that you just don't see when you're being coached by somebody. He was like a grandfather I never had. He was my, he was my Yoda. If I were Luke Skywalker, you know, he was a great man. And, um, he was one of five dudes that came into my life that I needed at that point. I was really lost. I had never really dealt with my past, with my family and what I saw as a kid. And he was, like I said, one of five dudes that showed up to help me understand why I was so reactionary or why I was so angry or why I was unable to get out of my ruts. And next thing you know, within a year or two of working with him, I started booking voiceover work all over the city. And uh, that led to an acting coach who had created the New York Acting Ensemble. He had um, created that ensemble with people like John Voigt and Dustin Hoffman and um, 
um, I'm trying to think of the other names. I'm name dropping now, but he, he, I ended up working with him. He was a five-time best-selling author and taught me the true creative process. He showed me how to take all this creativity and put it together in one formula. And that is what really popped me out of this negative implosive thought process um, because all I was taught was to take the low road and to connect the dots and I'm a victim or I, I have a problem. And I, they showed me you don't have a problem. Someone else is showing you something that's wrong. And you to take that same energy and power and give the community and give the world something that it can you know, benefit from instead of tearing you apart. And they gave me a voice that, that helped people. And we created an, from there, I created all kinds of stuff. I just started creating and didn't look back. And it, it led to me booking like 70% of my auditions, whether it was on camera uh, or behind the mic. Um, you know, I, my relationship with the Fisher House is a great example, creating companies, being an entrepreneur, and learning how to really help other people grow and what they wanted. And it's, it started working for like companies like iHeartMedia, which was originally Clear Channel. I would be brought in to conceptualize advertising campaigns for clients that didn't have a real big budget, but were able to run some advertising to help them get a bigger reach and what they were paying for. And we would come up with a creative plan that excelled anything that they would have got from an agency that a local radio station could provide. And then not only that, but we would also provide the quality and work that a top agency would charge them twenty, thirty thousand dollars worth. We could do it on a five thousand dollar budget. Man, I'm so all we talked about were just two mentors, two people that you were willing to give time, <laughs> give experience to, right? I mean, you volunteered your ideas, your time, your effort. You sought those people out. You had a vision. I mean, you sought out competence and and those basic experiences and just kind of riding the wave of the opportunity kind of brought you all the way to it. Now we were back at where Doc and Johnny was kind of doing it and, and kind of put you on and you, you kind of came through that already explained how you got a little crazy. Yeah. Right? You got, you got a little, uh, <laughs> you know, a, a, a little, I don't know. I wouldn't, uh, it'll lose me now, but let's just say you got out there. So, and you brought yourself all the way to here. Now take me back just before you're leaving out to LA for the first time. All right. So I had been, you know, working with Ken Yulo, who was my acting coach, he was the guy that was the five-time bestseller. Uh, he, he's considered one of the top horror novelists in the world behind Stephen King and a couple other people. And there came a point where I realized I had been given a window to detach from my hometown, my family. And part of his education was to teach a working artist, artist to have their own voice. He's like, if you're going to be an artist, you need to conceptualize your own thought process. You don't need to depend on mommy and daddy anymore. You don't need to depend on your friends. You need to depend on yourself. You need, he goes, everything starts with self. If you can't make up your own mind that you have a bigger problem and so a big part of his education was teaching us to take choices or b make big choices and go after big risks he said it's the only way you're gonna learn in life he goes no matter what you do it's always gonna be painful so deal with the pain and go just go create go be powerful go be magnificent but it's gonna come with a cost and after four years of training with him some of the guys were talking about moving out to LA and they came to me and they said hey um, we'd like you to come with us and I was kind of like what I knew you guys were going, but I didn't think you wanted me to go. What, why? And they said, well, you bring an anchor that we need. You bring an anchor to our equation. We, we, they, what they were really asking for is they needed, I wouldn't say necessary leadership, but they needed somebody that was rather fearless about going after something. Everyone in their own way was, but I would say out of all of us, I was probably more the street smart kid out of all of us. You know, if I could go back and look at everyone and I realized that, that the biggest thing they needed was somebody that has some comedy strength. You know, everyone brought a dramatic role or like Junior was, this guy Junior was great at, at pulling off a couple different roles. Uh, he's been on TV shows like, like Prison Break and a couple other big shows like that. And this other guy was great for like print advertising, but they needed somebody that brought a comedic role. And then I also realized later on somebody to, to let them know that everything was going to be okay. That's, that's what happened after we got to LA because people don't realize how rough a city like LA is. It's, it's a third world country. Just, it's really hard living. And unless you're the 1% most, maybe we call uh, you're it living in, 
we call it an emotional third world country, maybe. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's pretty rough. I mean, it, it, you're you're in an apartment with no air conditioning, no parking. Uh, to have air conditioning means you're spending about fourteen hundred dollars in rent. Um, I, w- I was spending nine hundred and fifty bucks for a room. I uh, wasn't even close to the beach, you know. And, and to make that kind of money, you know, especially the first year or two, is really hard. You have to go with a certain amount of money. And some of these guys weren't prepared for that. They weren't prepared for how hard it was going to be and how many hours you have to work each day. But it was good for us because it's like stepping on a treadmill at full speed. you got to come ready to play. And you've got people that have been there for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and they're not taking any crap from anyone. So when you come out there, you got to be ready to hustle and hustle on a level that you're not prepared for. And for a lot of, a lot of the guys, they weren't ready for that. Um, after the living that I had had, seeing stuff with my mom and my family, there wasn't much that was thrown at me other than one thing that happened in 2009 that I hadn't seen before, that I had already seen before. The one thing I didn't see was being homeless. And that happened in 2009 when the economy fell apart. I ended up losing 50% of my income, lost both my working agents, and went from living just on the uh, the hills of Glendale, Burbank, to waking up in the back of my Ford Explorer on the PCH because all the money disappeared. Commercial advertising stopped. There was no money. And and that within itself was a great test because what, if you want something bad enough. You, what year was it when you went out to L.A.? Uh, I moved out there in 2007, right? At, well, 2000, the end of 2006, beginning of 2007. Okay. And the first year was kind of a wash. Anytime you move somewhere the first year, you're just trying to figure out where the hell you're going. You don't know where anything's at. You don't know how the city flows. And for a city like LA, you got to know where not to go during traffic times. You got to know not to get on the 405 and the 101 at four o'clock in the afternoon because you ain't going nowhere for the next three hours. So you learn to take Laurel Canyon up over the hill, which is still going to take you an hour, but at least it's not an hour and a half. And you kind of learn how to deviate away from certain pockets of traffic at certain times of the day so you can get to auditions or, you know, to go meet someone. Or if you're drunk, there's certain roads you don't want to take, <laughs> which in L.A., I don't think they really care. Um, but uh, but it was interesting. It was an interesting process. And, and to, to, to maneuver from a city like Orlando to a city like L.A. was a really great test to see how bad we all really wanted something. And lo and behold, all of us are still working. We're all still very active, and I'm very proud of all those guys. Uh, we all went our own way, but it was it was good for all of us in, in our own way. For me, it, it, it showed me that I have no control. You don't have control. But you do have control. What, what you do have control over is how you handle it. It's like riding a wave. I can't change the wave, but I can ride the hell out of it and have some fun. And that's that's what I ended up choosing is to learn how to ride that wave. So really all I did was get up out of my car and piss on the rocks and slug a beer and then drive into town. It was great. <laughs> so so for three years you're out there doing your thing in LA. Um what's uh one of the roles you re- you remember most. Doesn't have to be the biggest. That's not what I'm asking. The one that maybe the first one, maybe the uh yeah, what was the first one you got? Or maybe I don't know, just one that you remember that uh kind of said, Hey man, I, I I may uh, pull this off. Um, I think the first time was when I got to meet a Grammy award-winning artist. Um, he was a 30-time Grammy award-winning writer. His name is Desmond Child. And Desmond was coming into our studios. I was producing a show called After Midnight. It's the largest syndicated country radio show. It's the equivalent to American Top 40. It's on like 1,200 radio markets, country markets for iHeartMedia. And he was coming in to do a podcast with our show host. They were trying to create some sort of entertainment podcast. It was something new they were trying. And I, they asked me to produce it. And I was like, sure, I'll do it. Sounds like fun. And they were like, well, the buddy that's coming in tonight, his name's Desmond. And I, I didn't know who the hell he was. And so I went out to the parking lot to greet him, bring him into the building. And as soon as I met him, I'm just being myself, engaging, shook his hand, thanked him for, for his time, brought him in, asked him if he needed anything. And it was just with me and just start talking to him because I, I don't care if you're a celebrity. I, you're, you're a human being. You piss the same way I do unless you have a, a vagina. Uh, I don't have one. You, you might. Um, but you, you put on pants. You do the same things. I mean, you're, you're a human being. And I just started talking to him, asking where he was from. I, it was almost like I interviewed him. And he took a liking to me immediately. Like there was something that just felt right in the conversation where, you know, where sometimes you meet someone and it doesn't feel like it ain't jiving. There's something weird going on. It was not weird between Desmond and I. And we ended up having an hour long conversation that actually postponed the, the podcast because the show host noticed that we like, there was something going there. It was like, a, like this really awesome conversation and he just left us alone. 
which, you know, a Dick Clark or a Casey Kasem or Ryan Seacrest may not like that. He was cool. Like, he was just like, do your thing, man. And I was really grateful for that because when the conversation was over with and we, we did the podcast, when it was all said and done with, the show host and I were talking to each other. And he goes, you know who he is, don't you? And I was like, no. He goes, he's a 30-time Grammy award-winning writer. He wrote most of the albums for Aerosmith, Cher. Uh, he wrote the Thong song. I mean, he's like, this guy's legit. Like, he's... He's a 30-time Grammy Award-winning writer, and I'm sure he's won more since. But that was 10 years ago. And he said, you realize that you held your own with him creatively. Like, you you had a creative conversation with him that made him think. And I went, no, I didn't realize that. And he's like, no, you held your own. Like, like that was really fun to watch. That's why I didn't interrupt you. Like, it was really fun to watch you, Stan, my producer, hold your own with Desmond Child in my studio. That's why I left you alone. And I, I went home and thought about that. I was like, holy crap. Like I had a really great conversation with a significant artist who has beyond shown his proof of creativity to the world. And I, I really took from that. And it was really nice because that's, I think that's what any artist looks for is that conversation, regardless of what they're creating is to have that kind of relationship with someone or that kind of moment. Because uh, I think out of my whole career, I'll take away from that more than anything else I've ever achieved was to have a moment between another human being, something uh, as that kid who grew up in Okoy, Florida with a drug addict mom and an abusive family would never thought he would have seen. You know, I used to walk down the dirt road that I lived on and would just stare at the sky and ask God to take me away from all that, give me a chance to live a life. And in that moment, I realized I had achieved that for once. It was, it was great. Yeah. Taking that risk that, that Ken would talk about, take a risk. You're going to deal with pain. And we did. There was five of us living in a two bedroom apartment gave me the opportunity to have an amazing conversation with Desmond child that would never have happened if I didn't get off my ass and go after it and give it a chance, man. I mean, you, you took a chance with friends, you followed the dream man, and, and those conversations mean a lot. Now, anybody can think back. And if I asked anybody listening now or anybody on the podcast, you know, what's a moment that influenced you? And a lot of times it is that conversation with someone that um, we admire. Maybe we don't even realize we admire. And I mean, you embrace that moment and just, you know, you were you were you, right? You just kind of let it flow. And so then yeah. L.A. happens and we all know the the economy in 2008 crisis basically goes it, it, it killed everybody. And so you're going into 2009 and w what happens and where do you go? Well, I want to just talk about the end of 2008. I came off one of my best years. I was booking tons of work. I just entered the union. Um, I was really pumped up. I was like, man, I'm in SAG. I'm booking work. I'm working by coastal. I was looking at going to Europe, actually. I had was accepted into a theatrical school in Wales. I was pumped up, dude. I was like, this little old coy redneck is ready. <laughs> and I had just auditioned for Verizon Wireless for it was going to be played in three countries. And I was, it came down to me and two other people. And I'm like, the, the director loved me. The director was like, I love you. I love your look. I love your energy. He's like, can you speak Scottish? And I was like, ah, I could barely speak English. What are you Scottish for? And I was like, come on, man. And he's like, you got to be able to speak Scottish, man. He's like, I want you. I want you right now. But you got to be able to speak Scottish. And I couldn't. I was devastated. And I left and I was devastated. But I realized, hey, you know, I just, that, I mean, that probably would have booked at least you know, over residuals and time uh, under a two-year contract, at least a couple, I'd like to say a million at least. Hey, can, running you, a, can you do Scottish? No, I still can't. Oh, uh, man, yeah, I'm still, I, I still speak, speak poor English. Um, so you, <laughs> you like the voice of me in arena, guy, though, man. Yeah, put me in a, an arena of football. I'm good, man. Uh, <laughs> Little League football, I'm great. You're the voice but, of Steve. But no, I mean, Scottish. The voice over master, man. Well, I know, I know. It's a dialect and it's a full education I haven't taken on yet. And uh, it's something I probably should have pursued, but I haven't. I'm, I'm a bum. But that, but anyway, get the, Scottish. Yeah, the other thing that <laughs> I remember also, I had just auditioned for one of the roles for one of the Fast movies, uh, Fast and the Furious. I can't remember which one it was uh, off the top of my head, but I had just missed out on that and I could feel the momentum. What's that? No, I was like Fast and the Furious 82, 34. <laughs> it was like one of the it was one of the first 80 movies that they did. Um, but I was really pumped by that because I was gonna play one of the smaller detective roles 
And they liked my look. They liked my attitude. I, I guess I looked like a scummy detective. Uh, they loved it. And um, Sin City this detective. non trustworthy Yeah. This non-trusting, pasty white detective um, living in Los Angeles. Uh, <laughs> but it, what ended up happening was uh, I didn't book it, and I was coming into December, and you know, getting into 2009, and, and I felt great, but I was not prepared for what came in 2009. And going into the holidays, my vocal coach Bob, who I talked about earlier, he passed away from congestive heart failure right after Christmas, and I found out going into the new year. I was not contacted right away. I found out on the 6th of January that he had passed. And then during the inauguration of Obama into the presidency, um, a lot of companies across the United States were eliminating jobs. And the building I worked out of was hit pretty hard. We lost like 30, 35% of our staff. And when I showed up to work that night, you know, a lot of the who were still there were crying. I mean, people were ushered into, um, meetings and told we appreciate your time here here's a severance package here's a box you'll be police escorted out of the building after you gather your things and that went on for like eight hours and so i walked into just a total chaos i, I got to keep my job but that was the beginning of one of the hardest years financially our country has seen since the great depression and it was really bad um i ended up taking a huge hit um the audition stopped because what i'm signature like my signature thing is commercial advertising and that disappeared because companies didn't want to advertise you know working out of a national conglomerate like premier radio networks we were only running advertising for mail enhancement and cash for gold so either people were having sex or selling their stuff and there are no more commercial advertising outside of that for at least a year and then it slowly but surely started trickling back and it, it took like five years to get some sort of momentum so i kind of put a lot of that stuff on hold because there was nothing to go after and the people they were going after were either celebrities that had a certain naming rights so they could get a return on their investment um or even the movies they were creating were remix like the a-team came out i think that, that next year um the, it was just a guarantee for, of money for them. So nothing unique or original was coming out. So a young artist like me, just now stepping into the union, they didn't care about because I couldn't guarantee a $34 million return on their investment if it were a movie or, or an advertising piece. You know, they couldn't and wouldn't make that kind of risk. So I rerouted my plan um, simply because everything fell apart. It didn't make any sense going after the same pot. There was nothing to to gain from that other than stroking my ego saying, hey, I live in L.A., so I spent the rest of the year laying low. I started traveling all over Southern California and went into Vegas. And the little bit of money I made, I, I used to honestly just celebrate the fact that I could drive around and check things out. Um, it provided enough money for me to sleep in my car, eat my food, pay my cell phone bill and insurance. And I just drove around when I wasn't at work. Or I went to the gym and worked out for four hours and took a two hour shower and went back to work. Um, that's how I lived for about six to nine months. And then all of a sudden I came up with the idea of creating my own companies and creating my own mentorship program so I could teach younger artists. Uh, and I did that with the help of one of my friends, uh, David Weika, who at one time worked at DreamWorks. He, he was the one that kind of started that, that, that plan because uh, I was living at his house by this point. And we, um, we just attacked it. We both were hit by the economy and we needed something to – generate an income so we created this apprenticeship program where we would put on seminars or we would share information would bring people we knew into the equation to give up information and then people paid a pretty good penny to, to hear those conversations uh just like doing webinars today and it led to some really great opportunities and it led to me having enough money to create my first production company which was voice of steel productions which focused on commercial advertising, but it, it led into me creating children's audio books, documentary audio for like the Fisher House. And um, it's it's created a lot of wealth for me over the years to cover what uh, the corporations were unable to provide me as an artist anymore. And it, it helped me get through that rough time and to exit uh, LA. And yeah. I ended up moving to Atlanta at that point. So that's what 2009 looked like. Yeah, that, that fall hit a lot of people in every demographic and a lot of people uh, aren't really sure you know how it hit hollywood how it really cut everything down especially advertising you're right man and uh, a lot of people even up even now up to 2016 as we've you know sort of climbed out of that still under the control of world banks and wall street but anyway uh and the same things are happening again that helped uh crash the economy back then but this isn't the show but either way 
um, a lot of entrepreneurship started happening. A lot of people started uh, coming up. They had to, right? It was the force because giant companies downsized. They cut, you know, uh, uh, benefits weren't the same. So people had to seek that out. And uh, you found a way to to apply a different skill of yours, right? You you started the voices deal, and now you're talking uh, voiceover mainly. You had apprenticeship too. Now, what really catapulted it uh, or catapulted the direction of Voice of Steel into voiceover? Um, voiceover was always what I wanted my focus to be. But as when I discovered theater, I discovered a completely way to process and create from. And I wanted to take that adaption into voiceover work. And I found that I could have that conversation by creating my own network of people. It was really hard to like have conversations with other people. I noticed like a lot of people didn't want to have that conversation, especially clients, because they just want what they want immediately. So you don't get that gratification that you need, that those nutrients that you need. So I decided, well, I'm just going to create my own team of people, my own group, my own tribe. And as I started to seek that out, um, it just it just kind of made sense. And it, it led to me working out of Greenville, South Carolina, of all places. I ended up there. And I created my own team of people. And some of those people I trained personally, or they were people on the outside that had a sustainability in the business that I brought in uh, to help me accomplish my goal. I, I have a full roster of voice talent at this point in time. So if a client needs something, I have people I can direct them back. And the best part is I don't expect to be paid for networking people. I don't want the money. I want the artist to get paid. If you pay me, it's because I do audio production and that's it. And I helped bridge that gap. And it just, it, it just made sense to help other people instead of trying to help myself. Because the more I helped other people, the more opportunities came my way because people were like, hey, I like that guy. He, he's genuine. He's, he's something that most people in the industry are not. And when I was living out in Los Angeles, I had a really hard time networking with people because in all honesty, I would say 98% of the people I met just wanted something from me. They really didn't have a true integrity of like really wanting to create a brand for themselves or for a company. They just wanted that instant gratification of like, look how important I am. Look what movie I'm in or look at this because we would create stuff and they wouldn't show up. And it's like, well, how the hell are you going to get to that big movie if you don't show up to this? You just ruined your relationship with me and I ain't ever going to hire you again. And, and that starts to spread. Now, the, to the individual that works hard and is not entitled, those are the ones that make it, which is why Hollywood's run by 100 people and not 2,000 people. Because the majority of the people that show up in Hollywood are only there to stroke their own ego, not really create something powerful and magnificent. And to the ones that do have a work ethic and do create, those are the people I started to seek out so that I had, for me, just a bigger trustworthy tribe of people to collaborate with instead of being let down all the time. Because uh, I would see it with casting directors. I remember going to a casting event and a director tried to pick me apart in front of 30 people telling me that I did something that I didn't do. And I, I felt really bad for her, but I had to set her straight in front of everyone. And I was like, that's not what I did. You're, you're misinterpreting it because you have no idea what you're talking about. And artists, are, especially actors, are not supposed to do that because you don't want to burn a bridge. But you know, I would see that kind of integrity everywhere I went. Everybody was always wrong. You're not doing it right. And it's like, yeah, you're full of crap. You know, you have an opinion. You don't even know why you have an opinion. And I started to seek out people that had opinions because they had a worth behind their integrity. And that's why people seek out people the way they do, especially in a city like LA, is because they want to be attached to people that are shakers and movers, people that actually get shit done. And it's really hard to connect with those people, which is why it takes so long to make it in a city like that because of that lack of integrity. And that's, uh, regardless if it was radio, theater, film, or voiceover, that's what intrigued me was finding those people. And I, I had a hard time finding those people in a city like LA. So yeah. I started bouncing all over the country. Yeah, I I've mean, been, in LA, you got to, I mean, we all get it that, you know, it's, it's who you know definitely in a town like that. And, you know, being authentic and trying to play the role that you're supposed to, but... Um, you know, there's, there's something to be said though, for somebody that kind of just says, look, um, I want to learn from you. I want to grow from you. You know, they have that authentic voice, right. And allow you to grow on your own too, right. That aren't, that aren't shaping yes. because I, I would doubt that if anyone says you can shape the creativity, uh, I don't know. It seems to me like those that make it in, uh, in Hollywood or out in LA are those that do just create freely, right? That just are themselves that design products or, you know, design their own brand, whatever it is, they're, they're so authentically themselves that it just happens to be that way. Right. And I can also see where that, that rubs a lot of different uh, shoulders or ruffles the wrong feathers, man, especially in a downed economy at the time. So 
I mean, you, you leave out of there. I mean, you're overcoming living in the car, putting your, I mean, that's, that's some street pounding shit, man. And then you decide to, you know, grab yourself, pull it together and put together voiceovers. And I mean, and, and a whole production studio. And not only were you doing that, you're hosting shows at the same time, working on nonprofits. I mean, it, it's the steady LA hustle. Yeah. In LA, if you want to make it there, you don't work six hours a day. You work 16 hours. You work 20 hours. You sleep four hours. One of my roommates was the makeup artist for Nip Tuck, and she would literally sleep two to three hours and drive back to wherever they were filming in Long Beach for the work they were doing. And I would ask her, I'm like, how the hell do you do it? And she's like, you don't want to know. <laughs> you know, but this girl hustled, man. That was true work ethic. And that's why she was hired to be the makeup artist for Nip Tuck because they knew they could depend on her. She she wasn't just good at her job. She backed it up with her work ethic and she got paid a really good salary. She lived in the Hollywood Hills off the five. I mean, she you looked out her window, you could see six houses on the side of a mountain. And she sat at the top of that mountain. And it and and it was great. She that was one of the places I lived when I was homeless. Uh, <laughs> she was awesome. But um it was uh it and that's the people you wanted to seek out you know but to find those people like i said takes a little time because you're enamored uh with so much bs just like you see anywhere else but it's magnified by 10. you know so you got twice as much traffic twice as much heat twice as much time to go to the grocery store and twice as much crap to sift through before you started to find the, the real people um, because they don't put themselves out there. Hey, I'm over here for you to come take advantage of. Um, it doesn't work like that. And normally the best way to find those people is for you to do something for them. And I started realizing, I was like, instead of me trying to force my career, I, I gave up the control and said, I'm going to take what I have and give it to other people. So I would meet film artists and go, hey, do you want to do a voiceover career? And they're like, I'd love to be in voiceover, but I don't know how to do it. Well, I know how to do it. So why don't you come hang out with me Tuesday night? I'll teach it to you at no cost. And you can pay me for creating your demo and you can pay me in cash and you can pay me in installments. And next thing you know, I'm making $2,000 a pop each month helping artists build their brand, teaching them integrity, teaching them how to audition, teaching them how to have those auditions in between their auditions and, and how to create their portfolio. And next thing I know, I was like, I got a whole business plan here. And, but now the market's saturated with those people. Back then there wasn't very many. And I started helping people obtain what they wanted. And because of that, they started referencing me to other people. And next thing you know, I'm auditioning for national content again. I'm getting plugged into the right places. I started auditioning for the good stuff. And my life just took on a whole new meaning. It, it popped again. And it was not because of anything more than I hustled, I made choices, and I helped other people. You, and that's why things started flow. You weren't reactionary. No, I wasn't being reactionary. I wasn't being a victim. Like I had learned as a kid growing up in that nasty home, I have a choice to make. I can either sit here and be a victim and blame everyone else, or I can leave and go make something of myself. And it doesn't mean I have to let go of my family, but I got to cut the cord to this chaos, this system that makes up my family. This doesn't work for me anymore. I got to move on. I've got to go find my purpose in life. And that's what creativity gave me, whether I was mixing music at, at 15 years old or producing a morning show at 19 years old or hosting my own show at 25 or doing voiceovers or film, I started to realize that it doesn't matter the creative outlet. What matters is that I have the right purpose in life. And my acting coach called that essential doing. You have the right essential doing in life. Your soul is attached to a, a purpose that is for the greater good instead of tearing your life apart or someone else's. You know, you, you're not you know, down in drugs and blaming everyone else. You might participate with a little alcohol and, you know, maybe a little something, something every once in a while, but you're not out trying to kill nine cops like my stepbrother did. You know, you're out there trying to make the world a better place where all of us can equally live a successful life because I don't, that's what I want for people is to have that opportunity. And, you know, it's amazing how the minute you start putting other people in front of what you sought out and tried to provide that that kind of passion or that authenticity kind of, you know, blossoms in you. And and now you're back on the air. You're going back with iHeartMedia. And so what, what's where am I yeah. about to hear you? Where am I about to hear you now, man? All right. So this year threw me a curveball I wasn't expecting. You know, it's called life. You're always going to be hit with with curveballs. And I had given up my 20 year my 20 year run in, in broadcasting to pursue an online education platform I helped create with um, my now ex fiance. Uh, we left 
Greenville, South Carolina, to live in Charlotte, which I love Charlotte. It's a great city, very progressive. I love what they've done with downtown. They're expanding like crazy. They got the light rail system that I love. And we moved just, just shy of downtown by a mile. And we were staying somewhere. Uh, we were renting out a basement, doing our thing. And I didn't feel comfortable moving there. For And I won't get into all those reasons because I'll sound like a dramatic punk. But something just didn't feel right. And I noticed in December that a storm was coming. Anytime you've been through storms, you can smell it in the air. Anytime anybody's lived in Central Florida, you can smell when rain's coming. You know, it might be sunny outside, but you can smell the humidity change. And yeah. you know it's coming. It's the same thing in life. When you've been through crap, you can smell it coming. You're like, something's about to happen. So I started seeking out work because I'd given up my career to work this education platform. And the conversation for us to rock that education platform had changed. It changed because of some business choices she had made, kind of clogged everything up for her. She, there, she wasn't in a space to talk to me and everything I was saying was coming out wrong. Anybody who's had a relationship knows that sometimes the best you can do is just shut up. And for me, I kept, you know, I was light, I was, I, gent I was gentle and I said, you know, we really need to talk about this. We need to figure out what we're doing because there's no money coming in and that's a problem. And we were already uh, past January at this point. We're two months into living there. Uh, some business choices she had made had led to a two to three thousand dollar loss, and then a seven thousand dollar loss. So right out of the gate, the financial of moving there, the financial of the businesses had tanked for the first time. And um, you know, I wanted to come up with a really nice conversation, just like I had with Desmond Child, and create some sort of great path to get us out of that situation so we didn't have to resort to some eight hour job eight an eight hour eight dollar job an hour job and and what ended up happening was um that's what happened i, I took a job at Publix. uh the rednecks call it throwing truck i've been throwing truck for them which means we've been unloading trucks and putting them on the shelves i've been a stock clerk and um i resorted to how i was raised my beliefs in life and that whenever you're trapped in a situation like that you do what you have to do to make it work it's not going to stay that way, but if you can't pay your bills on time, then it's just going to get worse, and I'm not going to go homeless again. I ain't doing that again, and so I took a job. I walked across the street to Publix. I worked a 14-hour day because we were light people, and the work had to be done, so I'd go in at 2 o'clock and get off at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, and that just made things worse because I wasn't there, uh, and it made her mad. Long story short, my problems and her problems could not be worked out, and she told me to basically to leave so i left and i um well i we, came to we talked Asheville, North. We, we, talked, we talked a lot about how you know that impacted you and how you came like privately you and i talked and how that, yeah. that cabin and that that getaway in that place man but you know where where i you know i mean man you've pushed through so much man i mean it's inspiring in itself just listening to the stories man of Oh shit! I, I, but the triumphs, the overcome, the peaks, the valleys, right? And pushing through continuously, creatively, man. And you know, I, when you sent me the uh, the information the other day that you were back on the air, man, I <laughs> I had to stop for a minute and go, you know, he, he, you know, he did that. You know, you you pushed all the way through, man, and you, you, you're you're right back at it again man i mean that that's the inspiration that i think everyone in the tribe of change that you bring that this story shows is that real life authenticity of the up the down but continually pushing forward creatively despite anything and here we are back live back with iheart radio again yeah what, what if i've learned anything from all these stories that i've shared is that when something falls apart which is mainly what you've heard tonight you've heard about the breakdowns and the reason I've shared the breakdowns in the direction I have is to let you know that you have a choice to fight back. You have a choice to survive that. You have a choice to rise out of that rough place. That rough place is what we tend to talk about the most um, because we want people to know that we've been through war and we survived it. And the last 120 days, I, I, figure, it, I figure it takes about 90 days to get out of that situation if you're lucky. Um, and so I retreated here just so I could, one, heal from the relationship healed from the lack of money that was coming in and my soul just needed some rest and what a better place to find that but in the mountains of north carolina so with that said it's been 120 days uh right on the mark almost and um i 
had started reaching out to people immediately. And the way I described it, coming out of a breakup like that or a situation, you kind of feel like you've been hit in the head with a baseball bat because you have a hard time wrapping your head around certain things because you're devastated. Your your orientation in life has completely been wiped out. It's like seeing a tsunami come through and, and, and it just kicks your ass. And it's just like looking at the aftermath of 9-11. The buildings are down. Everyone's just like, what the hell happened? They're looking around trying to see if they're survivors, cleaning. Then you got to clean up and then you got to rebuild. And I needed at least two months to assess the damage and clean it up. And then from there, I needed to rebuild. So coming here was at 90 days. I was only in Charlotte for another 30 days before I retreated here. So that first 30 days was just maintaining the chaos to get me out of there. And then I came here to where I'm at on the west side of the state to start my rebuilding process. And anybody that's in that struggle of what they feel is failure, it's not failure until you give up. And I hadn't given up. I was like Rocky Balboa getting his ass kicked by Mr. T. I kept swinging. I couldn't see where I, but I kept my feet moving. I couldn't see anything. I, I was just decimated. It was like Ray Charles in the ring, man. I'm going to keep throwing punches, but I don't know where the hell they're going. And I couldn't even conceptualize to write for my website, let alone, you know, be hard, hardcore creative. I was just in survival mode. And so I've learned that if you maintain survival mode, it's like building a house. That's your foundation. From there, you can start creating, but you got to have the right mindset. And the biggest thing is just be peaceful. Find peace with the situation. Find peace with what you're in struggle with. I had to find peace with her. I had to find peace with me. And I had to most importantly find peace with the universe and God, you know, how that looks to you. I, that's what I had to find peace with because I was going through this for a reason. I didn't ask for it, but I was going through it for a reason. And I had to accept what that looked like, find peace with it, and then put it behind me and move on. And when I started to move on, I had reached out to people that I had made relationships with the last 20 years. So it's always important to keep good lasting relationships uh, with people. So if you have a job and you've got some people, you never know when those people are going to swing back around and help you. And I sent an email out to four people that work for iHeartMedia, uh, or no, three people, three people. Two of them were our general managers, and the third one is like a VP of programming. Uh, one of the GMs didn't write me back because she, I think she's mad at me. Uh, the other GM said, I'll help you, just reference me. And then the VP of programming, he completely understood where I was coming from, and I had earned his respect a long time ago. And he said, I will gladly help you. He's like, you send me the job references on our website, and I'll contact the hiring manager directly. And after three or four tries, um, we locked in the opportunity for me to go back as a director in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It's a little bit smaller of a market than I've worked in, but I'm cool with that. I love it's, it. It's the beach. It's the beach, bro. Oh, and man. they're gonna put me, yeah, they're gonna put me back on full time on one of their classic rock stations hosting their afternoon drive show, which in 13 years I got away from hosting my own stuff. I've been a part of a couple morning shows as a sidekick and um, and then you know bouncing in and out as a fill-in host, but doing something full time I got away from because I enjoyed being a director and creating advertising and, and that kind of stuff. But to go back to my roots and to go back to being a host. This is going to be great for me. It's something I haven't done in a long time, and I'm going to rock it and make the best out of that situation because it's just going to elevate me to the next the next place. It's but it takes time to create. It, it takes time to, yes, it takes time to create that. Anybody that's struggling with what that looks like, or you've been through something like that, you have to have patience, and you got to just give it time. You, you, it's like growing a plant. Whenever you're creating something, whether you're repositioning your life or you're creating a character or you're building a, you're getting behind a voiceover script or you're building a brand, it's not something that happens overnight. And the fact that I was able to pull it off within one, 120 days is pretty remarkable because sometimes it takes two years to get your, your opportunities to come back. Um, and I just know that it happened that way for a reason. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity that they're giving me and to have the opportunity to make more money <laughs> to go after more of what I want and to do it on the beach will be really nice. Well, the, the last question, man, before we close out is if you could go back to the 19 year old stand now, what advice would you give him? Man, I would tell that guy, I would tell that guy to calm the hell down, man. He, I had something to prove. I had something to make up for. And, and maybe I wouldn't tell him to change anything. Maybe I would want him to continue on that path because I love who I am today. You know, I had to go through that because to go back and tell him to change something may ruin things because I didn't ask for my parents. I didn't ask for my family. I didn't ask to grow up 
in Okoy, Florida. That was that was forced on me from me entering this world through the conception of my mom and dad probably making out at the Central Florida Fair. Oh. Um, probably, I don't know. I wasn't there yet. Um, but but uh, whatever that looks like, you know, I I was given what I was given, and even as a middle school kid, I remember telling myself, because I was always deadly serious. No one ever knew that. And anybody who actually knows how creativity works in comedy, you'll find out these comedians are deadly serious. They're deadly serious people. But the comedy is what keeps their lives growing. It's where they get the little little kid inside, makes them happy. And and every time I would be sad by something my mom would do or, or a breakdown of my family or my dad had to leave, I, I would I would take it really serious, and I remember looking up at the stars. I said this earlier, and I would just say, "Hey, God, you know, I'm I'm going to change things. I'm going to change what this looks like. That's important to me. It's important to me to set a different tone in my family and to take things on a different course because my family only knew what they knew, and they knew by what they were educated by their you know the, the their family before my grandparents and their environment, their school." And they were only knew what they knew because of that same process before them. And I said, so if we have the responsibility of learning and growing and being better than the generation before us, then I'm going to take the time to ed educate and take a look at what that looks like, which is why I'm not married yet. Uh, it's why I've taken risks and traveled the country. You know, for some people, marriage is great. Um, but I, I found that, you know, well, my families didn't do real well. <laughs> yeah. Now you get to move to Myrtle Beach and be uh, live on the air where, um, you know, I'll come up and see you. I'll yeah, dude. You know, as you get there, uh, I'll be in Myrtle Beach for sure. Well, just so you know, I'm going to live on the inland in a, in a single wide somewhere. So my rent's like $110 a month. <laughs> I'm not getting a place on the beach. So don't, don't think for a minute I'm going to be living lavishly. I'm going to be living in a single wide and uh, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> You're already staying funny, man. I, it's, man. I appreciate you bearing your soul out here, man. I appreciate you letting me because that's the last thing I'll say real quick is that, you know, for the first 25 years of my life, I had a real struggle sharing my authentic, authentic, authentic side. I didn't want people to know that at home I had a mom who was broken or a dad who had left, not by, he didn't want to leave. He was forced and I, it was broken. And I didn't want people to know that. But as, as I got older, past the age of 25, and I started talking to people in the world and I started traveling, I started to hear the same stories. I started to hear things that were worse and people that were in just as much pain. And as I looked around, it, it really hit me when I went homeless in LA. I remember walking through, uh, I was on Ventura, Ventura Boulevard in, in Santa Monica, or not Santa Monica. Um, I was over by my work. I was walking down the street, Ventura Boulevard near the, near the 101 and the, and the uh, 405. And I started looking around and noticing people a lot different after I went homeless. And I started to notice how people walk around, walk around genu genuinely mad at the world or mad at themselves or mad at other people. They're just kind of mad. And I started asking myself, I'm like, how many people in my life are walk around with just happiness and peacefulness? And I can only think of two people at the time. And it's a real process to find that place. And it's a place I continue to look for myself. That's that's place of, of peacefulness and acceptance that the world is crazy and it's up to us to handle it better so that we live a better life. And I think that is an ongoing struggle that we'll always be faced with to some degree until we reach a place where we know there really is no control over what that looks like. The world's always going to be chaotic. But as an artist, our job is to bring order, identity, and meaning to that to a place that we can give the world uh, something to laugh at, something it can appreciate, or something that scares the hell out of out of us, you know, from a horror movie or something dramatic. It's it's our job to give the world something great and magnificent instead of something that's so tragic like shootings and and these these cowardly acts that we see in the world today, you know. Um, it, it sucks and and we really should spend our time doing something that makes the world a better place so we don't have to have armies of people to protect us we can just do our thing but that's that's not gonna happen anytime soon so I hope we find that place but I, d I doubt it and that's a whole nother political conversation that we don't need, need to get into but um, hashtag creative rampage there my brother <laughs> but I, but I appreciate you I really appreciate letting me kind of go off tonight and just let me say some things and share my very authentic place in life. And, um, well, I, I tell uh, people, man, if, if, if you don't share your story, cause a lot of people uh, are reluctant to share their story, but you know, I, I tell people that, look, if you don't find a way to share your story, I think you're doing humanity and injustice because we truly learn from the experiences that come before us of other people. 
what they felt like, what they, uh, you know, wh what they dealt with, whether it's in diaries, research, stories, movies, acting, right? All these things that we, we, we think will last uh, some lifetimes. But, you know, for everybody, everyone's experience is a story worth telling, is, is something that I think the world needs to be told. And, you know, if you're, if you're thinking out there about telling your story or doing something like that, I encourage you to do so because you're really helping, whether, whether it's the mistakes we make or the successes that uh, some of us feel. I mean, Stan, from sharing your story from the, the, the darkest points to the brightest points, these are the things that, you know, change the generations that are coming behind us because the only way they learn is from our mistakes. You know, and I say mistakes are our master's teachers and they have grown us and shaped us, man. Just just like your your life and your stories, my friend, have, have shaped you, man. We come from the same place, the same town. And, uh, you know, our, our stories are are almost uh, similar and the same, man. You, you've been a... Uh, a soul brother around lately, man. It's been great growing with you and growing close to you now, and and hanging with you. And I and I'm I'm proud of shit of you, man. I love the heck out of you. And I love the heck out of you, man. I'm grateful for you because, like, when I was going through this, I rolled over in bed one morning. I didn't want to get out of bed. I struggled just like everyone else. And I, I while laying in the bed behind this little wall behind me, I I got my phone and I called you. I texted you and you said, "Call me now." Uh, <laughs> and we got on to an hour long conversation. I kid you not. I went from very sad because I miss the girl that we just split up. I, I miss her. And I think about her every day and, and I'm a spiritual man. I do pray for her and I think about her and I hope that she's happy. I hope that she's at peace and I hope she continues to find what she wants because she deserves it. She's a hard worker and she means well. Um, I'm not exactly happy with some of the things that were handled, but that's just the way life is. Well, we talked uh, for a while that morning, man. Yeah. And that's a whole other conversation. But uh, I will say that, you know, if you're in conflict with somebody, you should probably do it face to face. That's all I'll say. But anyway, with that said, I was grateful for you for that morning because I was struggling because my orientation in life was completely shattered and you helped me reconnect in a different thought pattern to bring me out of that cesspool and to find the light and to find the hope and the happiness that I couldn't find that that particular day or the days leading up to that. And, it, and I, I was really grateful for you. That changed. That actually is what brought me closer to you. It was was my gratefulness for that. Well, it, you're uh, look. I'm just passing the torch, man, because more than likely it wasn't me. And uh, secondly, if you didn't listen, it just would have been sounds and shit coming out of my mouth. <laughs> I mean, I could have just been making monkey sounds and shit. You know, yeah. I mean? it wouldn't yeah. have done anything. So maybe I did. I don't know. But I mean, the listen, the application part, man. It's but it's that friendship, man. That's why I wanted you to share your story here for you know our tribe, the listeners, everybody else around, man, because it's uh it's inspiring. It's real. It's raw. It's, it's life for most of us out here, you know, living the authentic ways that uh, our generation has defined and concreted today. Right. Yeah, it is. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, man, for coming on, man. And, um, tell everybody where they can find you at uh, the websites and stuff, man. Uh, I think the easiest website, cause I've got so many, the easiest website is my main website, Stanley Fisher junior.com. That is S T A N L E Y. F I S H E R J R dot com. Stanley Fisher Jr. dot com. That's the easiest way. All right, man. We'll talk soon and I'll let everybody know when you're on the air and um, uh, Myrtle Beach. I, uh, yeah. uh, I'll be there, man. <laughs> I start in uh, the middle of August, so I got a little time. I'll, okay. I'll keep you posted. Yeah, let me know. We'll share it with everybody. But man, I, I love the heck out of you, man. Keep being inspirational, too, man. man. Keep moving people, man. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks again. You too. Thank you. All right, man. Love you. Love you too, bro.